stop me because <laughs> that means the uh, if you don't see that then it means we have we haven't gotten any recording and it'll be uh, an unhappy thing so let's see I'm on the S yeah I'm on the E yeah good check the calibration all right so what we're gonna do today is gonna spend about an hour doing a crash course in double E we're gonna do four of them uh, the current tentative times we've got today so this is Wednesday uh, at 3 p.m. The next one's probably going to be Friday at 10 a.m. Um, and I'll see if they can get us a better room that actually has, you know, a projector as opposed to one I have to carry down from my office and, and things like that. Um, if not, however, the lab is always available to us, so um, what the hell? We're going to be spending all our time here anyway. Might as well get used to it now. Um, sorry, let's just plug in. There we go. All right, um, then we'll do another one on Monday. Uh, I'm not quite sure what time, but it'll probably be around 3 p.m. I have to see, I got a bunch of other stuff going on on Monday, I have to see when I can fit it in. Um, and then we'll do the last one on the following Wednesday. So that means that by this time next week, you will have gone through four hours of supplementary uh, double E education. And I'm not gonna go into the theory behind it. I'm not gonna go into, um, all of the subtlety and complexity of it, I'm going to go into nuts and bolts. This is what we do. This is how we use it. All right? And I don't claim in any way that this is a improvement on EE 101, but if you haven't had it or you've had it a while ago or you're a little shaky on the subject matter, this will be, uh, uh, this will be good. You might want to prop that door open since people are going to cardboard right in front of you to uh, open the door and shove in there so people can come in. Yep. All right. So, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of give you basically a crash course. Where we'll get to today is probably through the basic linear elements. We'll get about halfway through this. Um, just introducing you to what it is, how they work, why they work. Uh, I'll also probably do just a little, uh, a little bit of complex numbers for you since uh, you're probably also rusty on that if you, if you don't know it and it, it comes up. All right. So, um, I like to use uh, water flow analogies for electricity, and the reason is is we can see water, all right? We have kind of an intuitive feel for how water flows. It makes sense to us. We've been around it all our lives. We can't see electron flow, all right? And thanks to Ben Franklin, we even have it all backwards because we think the positive charges flow, not the, the negative ones, um, which, you know. Anyway, so we can see the water flow. It's familiar. And so the idea is if I can find some nice analogies to what's going on in each of the element, you'll kind of get it, right? You may not get it exactly, but you'll get it enough that it sort of it makes sense to you. And once it makes sense to you, then you can, you can go on. All right, so what we've got are uh, the basic linear elements, so resistors, capacitors, and inductors, all right? So these are, uh, are the three basic ones. We'll get into uh, some simple circuit analysis. So Kirchhoff's laws, I've seen this spelled in about 18 different ways. Uh, it's a, an American spelling of a Russian name, and everyone sort of has a different. I've seen it spelled like that. I've seen it spelled with a C-I-R. You know, anyway, lots of different ones. Um, but the, basically, there's two of them. There's Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. And basically, this says that all of the currents flowing into any node must be zero, all right, which means essentially current cannot accumulate in any one place. All right? It has to, what flows in, flows out, think of it as a conservation of mass. All right? And it turns out that when I do the analogy, that's fine because it seems that, you know, again, water can't all flow into one place. At any node, all the water flowing in must also flow out, or else it gets, it fills, right? It gets heavier, it overflows. All right? Same thing, the voltage law uh, just says that the voltage going around any closed loop also has to be zero. Right? So if you go all the way around any closed loop, the sum of the voltage drops all the way around has to be zero. The analogy is that if you go around the system, the pressure has to get back to where you started from. Right? You can't have a, a discrete jump. Okay, uh, we'll talk about making measurements with a digital multimeter. Digital multimeter. Um, I'm trying to, there's a, I found actually a reasonably decent one that you can get for under eight bucks. Um, which I sort of want to add to your guys' lab kits, but we're going to probably buy sort of 10 of them and just throw them around the lab 
so that you guys can not use the big ones. They're very nice, high-precision instruments, by the way, but you don't really need them for a lot of what you do. And it's nice to be able to sort of take it with you and stick it on your circuit as opposed to bring everything over. All right, and then we'll get into um, the nonlinear elements. Uh, and then from there, we'll get into, so we'll have the diodes. Um, so there's regular diodes. There is a light-emitting diode. Um, there is a Zener diode. Right, and all of these are sort of various kind of, um, all of these essentially allow flow in one direction and not the other. Um, and that isn't actually true. If you give them enough voltage, what it says is they'll allow flow in both directions once. All right, they'll, uh, you, you, can, you can make it, you can destroy almost anything. All right, and once you destroy it, then it sort of, you've gotten rid of all of the, uh, the thing. But think of this as the, the hydraulic equivalent as a check valve. All right, so it sort of goes in one direction and it won't, and won't flow backwards. All right, and then lastly, we'll do the transistors, so the NPNs, the PNPs. Uh, we'll also do the FETs. Um, so there's the, the MOSFETs, the P and the Ns. Um, the transistors are, so basically in this class, we use them as switches. All right, so these are electrically controlled switches, and one is controlled by current, the other is controlled by voltage, and I'll show you both how those work. Um, for low current type applications, the transistors are good. Uh, the FETs are a little more expensive. The FETs kind of handle the medium levels of current and voltage. And then the once you get to very, very high currents and voltages, you go back to the, the, the exotics, the IBGTs, insulated gate bipolar IGBTs, bipolar transistors. Um, these are, you know, when you get into sort of the 600 kilovolt range, these are sort of, you know, big, monstrous things. You know, the, the, the heat sinks on it is, you know, it's a refrigerator, right? They, they bring them on trucks kind of thing. But th these are actually, they've come way down in price because of the electric cars. So they need to be able to switch the currents fast. And the FETs can't get high enough in voltage to do it. All right. So um, let's start with voltage. So voltage is a pretty simple, it's an electromagnetic force, electromotive force. Right, and the way to think of voltage in the water analogy is I've got some low pressure reservoir down here. And in order to, and I run it through a pump. Right, now someone is supplying that pump with energy. Right, and we're going to ignore who it is for now. Right, and out the top comes high pressure. So the difference in pressure between the low pressure and the high pressure is the analog of voltage. So on our other side, what we'll have typically is ground, right? We'll have maybe a battery. So this is a symbol for battery, right? And then we'll have, so we'll have low voltage down here. And we're going to have high voltage. up here. Now, the important thing to remember about this is the pump creates the pressure, but it doesn't need any flow to actually create the pressure. If I block these two sides off, right, I've still got the same pressure differential across, there's just no flow. Right? It says, hey, as soon as you poke a hole in it, I'm going to get a lot of flow. But until I do, there is no flow. So here's a, a really simple example of something that has pressure but no flow is your water spigot with a valve, right? So when the valve is closed, there's still pressure behind that valve, but there is no flow. Until you open the valve, nothing comes out. Same way, if you want to think about this, if I take a look at the, the wall socket, right? I can put a multimeter in there or, you know, lick my finger and stick it in. I will feel, I will feel that voltage, right? I can measure it. I can detect it. But until I make a connection across, there is no current flow. So that's the way it, uh, it says. All right, so that's sort of the basic idea of voltage. So voltage is the potential across. Uh, think of it as the pressure in water. You can raise the pressure really, really high, and as soon as you give it a path to go, it's going to go. All right? But until then, you can hold it back and still have this high pressure. All right, so talk a little bit about the various voltage sources. So a couple of different things you'll see. So you'll see um, things like this. 
So battery symbols, um, or often you'll see things like this. So all of these are uh, battery symbols, batteries. So you'll see things like that in a schematic. And we're going to be looking at lots and lots and lots of schematics. Uh, you'll often see things as labeled something like this. So plus 5, or it'll be um, VCC, something like that. Sometimes you'll see um, something here with a 3.3. You'll see, you'll see all these symbols around. There's not a huge amount of consistency right, between them. And so these would generally be uh, power ports or signals um, on your sign. And then sometimes you'll see something like this, right, which will have a number in it, and I'll have a minus and a plus. And this would be a, uh, a quote unquote, voltage source. Now, the idea behind all of this, um, and this would be sort of a signal voltage source, these are fictitious. Right? The idea here is that they will hold, they will flow as much current as they need to to hold that voltage always. And the answer is, that's fine for an academic analysis, right, for first order, but it won't last. Um, I, can, I can always devise a circuit that will draw too much current, and eventually it will sag. Your batteries will sag. Everything sags right, at the end. Uh, things wiggle, ripple around. But to first order, it's not bad. And as a sort of just a concept to analyze your circuits, a constant voltage source is OK. Um, the other things we've got, um, so these are all uh, DC sources up here. So these are all DC, which stands for direct current sources. Right? The other kind you have are AC, or alternating current. So for alternating current, generally you'll see something that looks like that with a minus plus something like that. And that will give you underneath a waveform which looks like a sine wave. Okay. Uh, very rarely, you will see something that looks like that. All right. Same kind of thing with a minus and a plus. All right. And this says that you've got a square wave of voltage coming in. All right. But that's pretty rare. And again, uh, the idea here is that this will give you a, a constant constant voltage um, independent of current draw. Like I said, these are not real devices. Okay? These are theoretical simplifications, but they work well enough that we use them all the time. Um, and some examples. All right, so. Um, so your bench supplies, so these are, uh, are pretty good. Signal generators, batteries, and you know, that's where you, that's pretty much sort of the, the gamut that you'll, you'll likely run into. Um, you know, generators, things like that. But eventually you can, uh, alternators uh, on your car, things like that. You can, you can find them around if anyone runs a generator when the power goes. All right, now, measuring voltage. All right, so when we talk about volts, we'll often say this is 5 volts, this is 3 volts, this is that. Uh, we're using a very sloppy shorthand because voltage is always measured, measured between two points. And if you think about it, that makes sense. So that, you know, the potential always has to be across two points. Right, I have to know what the potential is from one place to another. Right, so if I do my, my water analogy again, so here's my, here's my low pressure, pressure, my pump, and here's my high pressure coming out here. So the equivalent of measuring voltage is that I'm going to stick a little pressure gauge in here, right, between these two. And it's going to tell me what pressure rise I have across that pump. Right, good pump is going to give me a huge pressure rise. 
a bad pump is going to give me a little pressure rise. All right. I can write it in reverse, by the way. This is how the this is how hydroelectric dams work, right? So they uh, they drop water down a fairly high hill, right? It hits a turbine and it goes from high pressure because of the fall. It's got a huge amount of kinetic energy. It slows it down. The pressure goes way up. Spins the turbine, extracts all the power out, and uses it to run a uh, uh, a turbine. Uh, to give you an idea, sort of some of these turbines are quite large. There's one at um, there's a hydroelectric dam in Brazil that spans the Brazilian-Paraguay border called Itaipu. Uh, my dad was one of the guys who built it, so that's why I spent six years in Brazil. Um, and one of its 19 turbines um, is basically from that corner to the end of Jack's Lounge, um, and it produces just under a gigawatt of power um, when, they're, when they're doing it. They, they had to do some funny things there. Um, by the way, the wires that come off of that are, you know, you have to bring the current out. Right? And so the wires that come off the windings are um, big, solid copper pipes that go up, and they're surrounded in glass tubes that are filled with argon um, so that they don't short, because they'll arc right through the air. Uh, there's enough moisture in the air to create a, uh, a current return path. And so and even then, it's like static electricity all over the place. It's sort of like being, being near Frankenstein's monster. It's kind of cool. Um, no, no, they've been, they've been pretty safe with it. They haven't, uh, they haven't done that. They did a funny thing. It was split nine and nine. Uh, so nine turbines to Paraguay, nine turbines to Brazil. Um, but four of the turbines provided all of Paraguay's power, all of it, like everything. And so Paraguay sold the power from the five back to Brazil to pay for its half of the dam. Um, except the downside of it was Paraguay was on uh, uh, 60 cycle, 120, and um, Brazil was on 220, 50 hertz. And Brazil offered to pay to rewire the entire country so they didn't have to do it at the transformer, but they, you know, no. Anyway, so in the case of a, um, a voltage across our, our electrical, so I have ground, I have my battery, and again, I'm going to, so here, I'm going to measure the voltage between these two points, right? So this is my delta volt. So the unit of voltage is a volt, it's kind of why it's called voltage. Um, and again, whenever we say, you know, the voltage at a point is, it means implicitly we're referring it to ground. Right, so that's an implicit assumption that we, that we put in there that we're referring it all back to ground. All right, and um, typical things you'll see Batteries will run from about 1.5 out to about 12 volts. If you stack your batteries up in parallel, you can in series, you can get up to about you know 48 volts. You're not going to see anything higher than that um, in this class. Uh, as I said, if you stick your finger in the wall, you get 120 volts coming out. If you travel overseas, you'll get as high as 220. Um, in a bunch of transformers, when they take the oscillating one, put it through a uh, a full bridge, you'll go up to uh, as high as 380. Um, but generally, that's you know this is house power. Um, if you've got a big dryer or a uh, uh, or an oven, it'll often be on 220 power rather than uh, rather than 120. So if they actually have three two independent circuits coming into every house. So one is high, one is low, and one's in the middle. And so you sort of for each of your 120s, you grab on the half, and when you need the 220, you grab onto either end. Um, so and why they do this, electrician for electricians, the white wire is hot. All right. And the black wire is also hot. Right? The black wire is not ground. The green wire is ground. Right? This will save you from a much uh, unanticipated jolt when you, if you ever start playing with your own house wiring. All right. Uh, we've talked about ground. And so let's be a little bit more formal. So ground provides a reference point. Reference point. All right, so uh, again, let's do our water analogy. Let's think of a big, giant pool of water, right, my reservoir. And then I have my, my uptake. Here's my pump. And I've got my high pressure here. And I do something with the high pressure, and eventually I return it back to the reservoir. All right. So that reservoir is so big that it really doesn't matter how hard my pump works. It's never going to affect the reservoir. The reservoir is just, that's kind of my reference. It's at 
it's a lake. Right? And you know, I've got an aquarium pump, and I can try as hard as I might, but I'm not going to affect the pressure in the lake with any kind of aquarium pump. So same idea um, is when I look at the electrical side, so you'll often see, so I'll have my battery. We'll go up, and then we'll go through some kind of load, all right, where we actually use the power in the battery to do something. And then eventually that path returns to ground. Now, very often in when we're drawing schematics, so formally, what we would do is reconnect them. Right? It's such a pain to reconnect them on schematics. You'll have ground wires going everywhere that you never bother. Right? Instead, you just say, well, I'm just going to put, put it ground. So there's a couple of symbols you'll see for ground. So the common one I've been using is this one, which is three bars getting sort of narrow in the shape of a triangle. Um, there's this one. Now, technically, that's earth, all right? earth ground. Uh, you'll see that on a lot of um, house drawings. They'll have a, usually they take your water pipe, and they wrap a strap around it, and that is earth ground. Uh, that's where your lightning rod connects to. Um, and they like it to go sort of deep. You'll also see something like that. Usually, that is a signal ground. And depending on the circuits that you work with, sometimes you'll have multiple grounds. You'll have an analog ground and a digital ground, and eventually they'll tie together at one point only. Uh, that's called a mecha ground, so that, that connection point, um, because all paths lead to that. So that's the, uh, that's the jargon. All right. Um, let's talk about current. All right. So we've talked about voltage. Voltage is the pressure. It's the pressure in the pipe is your voltage. All right? It's the potential. But the actual flow, that's the current. So if I have my pipe, right, and inside my pipe I have my water, and it's flowing through. So the flow through the pipe uh, is going to give me the uh, is going to give me the current. So likewise, in my wire. I'm going to have, here's my wire going down, and I'm going to have my current flowing in. So I'm going to flow current down the wire. And we can thank Ben Franklin for this. We flow from positive to negative. Because before they understood this, they assumed that it was the positive electrical particles that moved. Right? It turns out this is completely wrong. Right? The electrons are the only ones that move. There are no, well, there are positrons, but we don't get them. All right? We don't get access to them. All right? And so the current, the actual flow of stuff is going in the opposite direction. But this has persisted for so long that nobody, nobody does it the other way. Right? So it's always, always, always positive current flow from positive to negative, even though physically what's happening is actually the exact opposite. So that's where we... Uh, that's where we have it. Um, again, that, uh, we get to thank Ben Franklin for that. The unit of current is the ampere, A-M-P-E-R-E, -E, also shortened to A or amps. Okay. So the um, <clears throat> so where your um, uh, the kind of, of flow levels you'll see, the kind of current levels you'll see typically. So a typical circuit, really small circuit you might build, might have, you know, two to three milliamps flowing through it. So milliamps times 10 to the amps times 10 to the minus three milliamp. Um, some very low power sensors will be up in the, be in the microamp range. Um, likewise, a microcontroller typically will be sort of in the 50 to 100 milliamp range. If you start throwing motors around and, uh, and start spinning things up, you might see, you know, 1 to 5 amps kind of thing. By the time you get to sort of up to 10 amps, you know, 20 amps, you're starting to look at arc welders. Right? Arc welders are in sort of the, uh, the 20 amp, 30 amp range. Um, if you get into sort of the electric vehicles, you know, now you're talking in the uh, sort of 65 to about 150 amps. Um, so they're starting to throw significant amount of current flow uh, going through there, all right? And those have uh, have some issues. All right. 
So just as we had voltage sources, we've also got current sources. And again, these don't exist. Right? They are entirely a theoretical construct, right? which is used to say that this will basically, this will deliver a constant current flow regardless of voltage. Regardless of voltage. So what this means is it's going to say, look, I'm going to I'm going to supply 300 milliamps whether you make it, whether you draw whether there's 5 volts behind me, 50 volts behind me, 500 volts behind me, I'm still going to give you 300 milliamps. All right? Never going to happen. What we can do, so as examples of these, all right, the short answer is no real ones exist. Um, what we can do is we can build circuits that approximate um, a current source over a limited voltage range. Right, so if you can scope down the voltage to a little bit, it's sort of a more reasonable thing, you can do it. Um, it's used entirely as a theoretical tool, theoretical tool um, for circuit analysis. Circuit analysis. And again, it makes things just fine and honky-dory. OK. So now we know what current is. We know what voltage is. We're going to talk about um, the simplest, cheapest thing we get, which is the resistor. All right, and the resistor has typically the symbol looks like that. Let's actually make it a little bit more. Yeah, so that's the resistor symbol. All right. uh, the typical ones we have are made out of carbon composite. All right, and the resistivity of it is um, rho L over A. So basically, rho is the resistivity in ohms per centimeter. Uh, L is your length. And A is your cross-sectional area, which is basically to say it's a device. And if you look at it, if you look at one of the a typical one, right, it's got a, uh, a wire coming out of both sides. And what you'll see is a couple of stripes of color going down. If any of you are colorblind, I'm sorry, but that's the way they mark resistors. All right. So if you, uh, if you are colorblind, sit through the DMM and organize yourself well. All right. And it, uh, it won't take long or, you know, ask your neighbor. Is this, uh, and, and by the way, not being colorblind, I have to tell you, sometimes the difference between brown, purple, and red is not much. Right, you look at them and you're like, yeah, that's the, uh, that's it. Um, there'll be a little gap, and then there'll be another stripe that tells you how good of a resistor it is. All right, so if you look in Appendix C of H&H, of Horowitz and Hill, uh, they have the resistor color table for the 5%. Right? And you can look on web. There's about a million of them. I have an app on my iPhone that uh, does it. And I think there's an app that actually you take a picture of it, and it will actually tell you what it is. Um, but uh, uh, what's that? Yeah, no, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, in any case, uh, they run from a range of approximately 1 ohm to approximately 20 mega ohms. All right, And these are about 3 to 5 cents per resistor. All right. They're pretty cheap. Um, the other thing you've got, the resistance is, unfortunately, a function of temperature. Right? They try very hard to make it a weak function of temperature, but it is a function of temperature. And the kind of variation you can see is when you go from 0 to 100 Celsius, so from freezing to boiling water, you'll typically see on a 5% resistor something on the order of a 20% change in value. They're getting better, but the truth is, is the better ones get binned and they charge a little bit more. Right? They'll test them, 
and they'll do that. They, they do this a lot with the manufacturing process, where they can now test things so fast that literally as they come out the line, they're testing them and they get sorted into do. They do the same thing with microprocessors, by the way. So the difference between an i7 and all the others, the, the, the various flavors of them, is that this one tests for faster clock speed without errors, and they just, you know, the little thing, they just bend them and charge you more for them. All right. And so they, they get more of the others, and that's how they do it. All right, so uh, the water analogy. All right. So what a resistor looks like is basically a narrowing, a narrow throat in your pipe. All right. And what happens is, as the flow narrows, of course, it slows down. Right. And so you get a, uh, so it restricts the flow across, even though I have, I can put as much pressure as I want. All right. If you really want to go. Um, a little too far down the, uh, the hydraulic analogy. If I put too much pressure in, I got a shock to throw, uh, flow goes transonic, and then the, all kinds of bad things happen. But um, in any case, we have the electrical analogy. So this is so just think of it as a, as a restriction, right? A flow restrictor. Um, you all have them in your showers. There's a little thing with a little hole in them that you know you hate at the hotels because you turn on the shower and nothing actually comes out. So you, you know you keep a pair of pliers in your bag so that you can yank it out so that you uh, can take a nice shower and put it in when you're done. Um, What's that? You did that, Kresge? Exactly. Uh, I, I, you know. So same thing I have here. I have current flowing by. So the unit of resistance is the ohm. And the symbol is a capital omega. And these all respect Ohm's law, which is that V equals IR. This is Ohm's law. All right. The only other one there is, is P, the power, equals I times V, which is equal to I squared times R, or V squared over R. I kid you not, this is about the extent of the formulas we use. All right. We don't go much deeper than this, but we do, do, the, we do use this a lot. All right. And you'll be kind of surprised how much we use this. All right, and how sophisticated you can get using nothing more than this. All right? And we'll get a little clever about R. All right? we'll, we'll use complex R's for inductors and capacitors, all right? and that'll allow us to do really kind of uh, very interesting things. All right? The resistors come, so the symbols for them. So typically you'll see uh, something like this, uh, and often it'll have uh, sometimes it'll, it'll, it'll rarely have the actual, the ohm symbol, uh, the omega on it. It'll just be the, uh, the value for it. All right. Uh, sometimes you'll see this for a variable resistor. This is pretty rare. Uh, you won't see this often. Uh, what you will see is things like this for potentiometer. All right. so this is, uh, say this will have 2.7M, or you'll see things like that. Uh, so these are all, these two are potentiometers. I'll talk about those a little bit later. These are variable resistors. These are resistors that you can change the value of the resistance. Literally, you are moving this wiper across. There's usually a coil, and you're sort of moving where it makes contact. All right, so they, um, that's how they work. Uh, if you see any European schematics, instead of this symbol over here, they'll just have a square, and they'll put 3K3 for a 3.3K, and sometimes it'll be written inside the box, uh, depending on how you do it. Um, you get a whole bunch of different power ratings. The standard ones are eighth watt, and again, that's right here. This, you know, so if you know your resistor, right, and you put V squared over there if you're connecting it to ground, right, that's the amount of power you can dissipate in that resistor, right? So an eighth watt or 125 milliwatts, right? And then, uh, so this is the standard, the most common are eighth. You get quarter watts. A little fatter, a little more expensive. A half watt, one watt, fives, tens. You're getting into what are called the power resistors here. Power resistors are meant to sink a huge amount of heat. Right? They're big, and you'll see that often they have metal fins on them to, uh, you know, and big little beefy leads to uh, to get on that. Um, and the reason is, is so generally you use these to simulate things like motors. Or, or sometimes you need to uh, to drop large currents through and not have the thing go pop. Okay. So typically what they look like, 
the metal film resistors, this isn't as good as I'd hoped to see, but um, so these, and the metal film resistors, will have little numbers printed on them, and you'll often see a number that looks like 1002. Yeah. Sure. Better? No? Hold on. There we go. OK. So typically, you'll see something that looks like 1002. All right? And these are, um, what this says is this is 100 times 10 to the 2 ohms. Right? So if you see 5706, right, that's 570 times 10 to the 6 ohms. Right? And they won't tell you anything else. These are typically the 1% resistors, and these will cost you 10 to 25 cents a resistor. How accurate it is. So that percent will tell you that this is 100 times 10 to the 2 ohms, plus or minus 1%. Right? And you can rely on that. Is there like a standard temperature that they're usually at? Yeah, those are usually at the standard temperature, 25 degrees. What's that? Is it 30C or 25C? OK, 30C. Got it. All right. The uh, so uh, this would be uh, ten kilo ohms. Okay. Now the five percent, right? You're only going to get four numbers. Right. The one percent, you'll get five numbers. Right. And so that's. But basically, if it's printed on the side, right, and it actually has sort of a series of numbers and not the color bands, it's a one percent resistor. And there's a couple of 2% out there, but you're never going to find them. All right? Yeah. Uh, can you rely on the 10% to not be within 5%? No, you cannot. You can uh, and most of them are. All right? That's the scary thing is most of them are really a lot better than they, than they should be. And so the reason for this has to do a lot with uh, contracts that manufacturers supply parts at, all right? and especially to the automotive industry. So if you're a maker of some electronic part and you sell it to the automotive industry, you just committed to sell 10 or 12 million of them, all right? which means this is a big contract. Right? So what they say is we want, you know, if you tell us that five per, they're plus or minus 5%, not Six Sigma are plus or minus 5%, all of them are plus or minus 5%. Because if you ever deliver a batch and they measure one and it's outside of 5% and they have to issue a recall, you pay for it. That's part of the contract. All right, so this is why they're actually a lot better than would be indicated by the, uh, by the percentage, um, because every last one of them will hit the spec. All right, so that's a, uh, and, and basically that's why they test them in-house. Now, as they get better at testing, they can actually get sloppier, as it turns out. So they're, they're probably going to start to get worse again um, as, the, uh, as the testing has gotten better. Um, the other one, the, the eighth watt uh, carbon film, these are the kind you're going to get in your, is that one you still want yellow? Yeah, we'll do yellow. So these are the 5%, uh, very typical. All right, and these are about the 1 to 5 cents per. All right, and again, you buy in bulk, you get a better price. All right, when we buy little surface mount ones that we put on that, are, uh, um, that go down on the boards, we're usually down under, under a cent per, usually under 2 tenths of a cent uh, per resistor, but we're buying you know, 500 of them, and they, uh, you know, and, and they come in this little tiny package. Because there's, yeah, there's not much there. Because uh, a lot of the cost in this is actually literally the metal of the wire going through and the amount of carbon film that they have on there. Right? So that's a, and you know, making the colors go on them. All right, and then the quarter watt look just like the eighth watts. They're just fatter. Right? And they're fatter because they have to have more area to be able to dissipate more heat. And they typically run about uh, 1 to 10 cents a pop. And they're usually also within the 5% range. All right. The power resistors. So these are what these guys look like. All right. So as I said, you know, they've got tabs. They've got little heat fins on them. They're big. Okay. And you know, you'll often see one. They are, you know, they, and they come in relatively low, um, low uh, resistance ranges because if you think about it, you know, if I have a one kilo ohm power watt resistor and I need to, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna put ten watts through through a one kilo ohm resistor. 
I need about 100 kilovolts to put it to do that, right? That's a lot of that's a lot of current. It's a lot of voltage. I'm not going to get there, right? So they tend to be in the relatively low. So you'll see things like 0.1 ohm uh, power resistor. So at what's that? Yeah, I've seen those too. So at one volt, that will give you 10 watts of dissipation across there. Right? So as they get small, they start to get. So if you think about this, if I have a, let's say I have a 50 volt rail, and I go through a 600 ohm resistor, right? Then I've got 50 squared over 600, right? So, um, which is equal to four, right? So I can do, so that's four watts, right, going across that, right? So a good rule of thumb, all right, so here's a good rule of thumb. A good rule of thumb is if you're using a five volt rail, hello. So if I'm using a 5-volt rail, which is typically what you guys will be doing in most of your circuits, um, and I use a 1 kilo ohm or bigger resistor, then 5 to ground, if I hook, the hook it right from power to ground, right, I'm going to consume approximately uh, 0.1 watt, which is safely under the 0.125 that an 8th watt gives me. Right? So as long as I use resistors that are 1 kilo ohm and bigger, I don't really have to worry. Right, I'm not going to dissipate too much power. Um, by the way, just in sort of an annoying little tidbit of physics, the resistance goes down as the temperature goes up, which makes it flow more current, which gets it hotter. So it is a runaway process. Right? So when you're, when you're teetering on the edge there, as it gets hotter, it starts to get lower resistance, which sucks more current through, which means it's dissipating more power, which keeps on going, and so eventually it'll... Uh, It'll get nice and toasty. Uh, a really good way to test if your circuits have a problem, by the way, is each of you carries with you a calibrated temperature sensor on the pad of your fingertip. Right? You put your finger down with reasonable pressure on your circuit. If you can count to 10 slowly without the urge, the overwhelming urge, to pull your finger off, the circuit's doing fine. You're probably within all your power specs. Right? If you can make it to sort of three or four and you're like, yeah, you're, you're burning power somewhere, a lot of it. All right, and uh, the other thing, which is which turns out works really well, is your nose. Right, sniff your circuit. All right, so you get your nose really close and sniff around. You will actually smell the epoxy starting to go. All right, and that will give you a little bit of lead time before you've actually popped the circuit. If you see the smoke come out of a part, if a part ever sort of gives a little puff of smoke out, all right, it's let out the magic smoke. That part no longer works anymore. All right, throw it away. Doesn't matter how much you paid for it. It's gone. Right? And the stupid thing is, if you hook it back up, it just might continue working, but you have no idea what you broke. Right? And it might die at any point after that, so just toss it. Right? It's the only way to do it. Okay. Um, likewise, if you, are, if you find yourself using 100 ohms or lower, start, you know, get at least a quarter watt and start increasing the power, uh, the power capacity of your, of your resistors. Uh, oftentimes, you can... So if you gang resistors in um, parallel, right, to make the smaller one, you still have the each individual one uh, dissipates less power. It's kind of cheesy to do, but you can, if you don't have a lower resistor, it's, a, uh, it's not a bad way to get there um, and get more power uh, dissipation going through. However, um, it's not, they won't all be exactly the same, which means whichever one has the lowest resistance gets more power, it's get hotter, which makes its resistance get lower, which gives it more power, which means it gets hotter. And you know, eventually, if you if you are right at the edge, you'll pop one, then the next, then the next, then they just go all the way around like a little Gatlin gun. Um, go. All right. Um, I talked a little bit about the variable resistors. So these are the ones with the symbol. So you'll get one of these in your lab kit. And we often call these trim pots. And the reason trim pots is your circuit is close. What this allows you to do is you've got the three terminals, one, two, three. All right, so one, two, three. And so you hook this into your circuit, and there's a little screw right there. Right in there, there's a little screw head, and you put a screwdriver in, and you turn it, and you can adjust the resistance. All right? They are um, horrible temperature stability. Which 
means temperature changes a little bit. They, uh, they change all over the place. They're expensive. And um, there are a couple of digital ones, which essentially have inside a ladder of resistors. And it can hook various ones up together to make it uh, a lower, or so it takes resistance in discrete steps. These are digital versions. They're often called digital potentiometers, digital pots. Um, we often use these uh, when tuning circuits, right, where you say, OK, I know the resistance needs to be somewhere in this valley. I don't know exactly where. I'm going to put it in the middle, stick it in there, look at the oscilloscope, and just crank back and forth until I'm at a, uh, at a decent value. And then I've got the performance I like. I'm done, all right, except you're not done. At that point, what you do is you pull it out of the circuit, you measure it, and you put a real one in and see if your circuit still performs well, right? And then you, uh, so having it in there, the problem is is they drift, right? They, even without temperature changes, they just, they slide all over the place, all right? So they'll be roughly the same. And if you actually, uh, if you take apart some old electronics, you'll often see a bunch of these with a little dab of hot glue uh, on top of them to hold the screw in position, right? So it won't, won't back off or turn, right? You'll see that less and less nowadays, but those are, those are there. All right, so that covers resistors. Let's do capacitors. What's that? Five minutes left? Uh, let me finish capacitors, and then I'll, what's that? What's that? All right. So thank you for the lights. All right, so capacitors. So the hydraulic analogy for capacitor is I have my I have my tube going around. I have my pump. And my pump comes around. And I have a chamber with a flexible rubber diaphragm across the front. Okay? And as I push high pressure up this way, it's going to cause my diaphragm to bulge that way. If I shut down the pump, it's rubber. It's going to try to try to come back to neutral. If I reverse the pump, it's going to bulge the other way. Right? The idea is this diaphragm can move back and forth as the pressure changes. Right? Now, immediately you can see that I don't really get any flow across this. Right? There's a barrier there. Um, at least I can't get a steady flow, but I can, make it, I can make it look like there's flow going back and forth by oscillating this diaphragm by changing the pressure on the other side. Right? So how this works in the electrical world is I've got my battery or my voltage source. And I'm going to come and I'm going to have two plates, one which is going to have positive charges on it, and the other one of which is going to have negative charges on it. And the unit of capacitance it's called a farad, and a farad is huge. Right? You'll most likely never run across a one farad capacitor in your lifetimes. Right? They're getting more common now than they used to be. But yeah, so generally you will get units of picofarads, which is times 10 to the minus 12, nanofarads times 10 to the minus 9, uh, or microfarads times 10 to the minus 6. So microfarads, generally a big capacitor is, you know, 100 microfarads. is a big tin can cap. All right. Um, let's see. The symbols you will see for a capacitor are, um, so some of them you'll see something like this with a plus on it. So that's a polarized capacitor. That means the plus has to go to the right side. And uh, you'll often see them with a curve on it like that or just like that, and you say, wait, this looks an awful lot like the, uh, the voltage symbol I had. And the difference is the voltage symbol is going to have that little leg shorter than the other two. Um, and again, the ones that are polarized, so polarized caps uh, are bigger than the non-polarized versions. Basically, you can't get big non-polarized caps. Big in terms of farads? Yeah. 
and and the the size and the capacity, the capacitance of them go hand in hand. And I'll show you why in a second. All right. Yeah, and sometimes you need things to be polarized. Sometimes you don't. It depends on the on the circuit. Um, but often the uh, so where we use capacitors a lot, by the way, and we'll get this we'll get to this later. But we use capacitors as bypass as little local charge reservoirs that we put right next to the chip in question that we need. And the reason is, as soon as that chip needs to draw power, instead of going all the way down the wires to wherever the battery was, there's a lot of inductance there that makes it hard to get that current immediately. And so the locally, the current, the, the voltage will sag as it tries to draw it. You have this capacitor right there that's sort of a little local charge bucket. And so you sort of say, I need more, or I'm giving back some. And it basically gets sucked into this little diaphragm, and it sort of expands or contracts to give it to you. All right, so that's the, that's the general idea. Um, so. Uh, big thing about capacitors is they cannot pass um, a steady current, which is to say, at DC, they look like an open circuit. However, at high frequency, they look like a short circuit. Right? High frequency, when it's going back and forth, flows right through. Right? You don't. It's almost as if there was no diaphragm. Right, and so this is a um, this is what we use. So let's um, let's see here. We're going to do so um, the unit farad is defined as um, a coulomb per volt, where coulomb is a unit of charge. Uh, it's a unit of charge, and so. Q equals CV, um, if you must know. So I equals C dV dt. All right, so it has to do with the time rate of change of voltage. The current you see is proportional to the time rate of change of voltage. All right, and what I'm going to do here is do a very, very quick segue into um, complex numbers. So if I give you a number that looks like e to the j omega t, all right, or e to the j omega, or e to the j omega t, right? The length here is 1, and that angle is omega t. So as time goes around, this thing is spinning around. That's what we call a phaser. So e to the j omega t looks suspiciously like a cosine, right? And because all we're looking for is the the magnitude on the real versus the imaginary axis, all right? So spins around, looks like a cosine, right? So if we say, okay, I'm going to do that the voltage is going to be V naught e to the j omega t, all right? So now I'm going to have a length of V naught, and it's going to go around every omega of your omega t, 2 pi, it keeps going. All right. And that means that I is equal to, um, well, it's going to be C times dV dt, but that's just going to be C times V naught J omega times um, E to the J omega. Right? So it's just a straight derivative. Right? And if I call j omega c v naught, I'm going to define this to be i naught, I get that v naught is equal to i naught over um, j omega c. Right? Just by setting the two of them equal to each other, right? And all of a sudden, I said, well, wait a minute. I remember this. This looks an awful lot like V equals IR, just R. So we call it Z for the complex impedance. Looks like 1 over J omega C, right? So what this says is that in our circuit, the capacitor just looks, it looks just like a resistor 
except that it has this complex resistance. So it has a resistance that varies with frequency, which means that when the frequency is zero, as in DC, right, it has an infinite resistance, no current flashes. When it's a very, very high resistance, when omega is infinite, that drops to zero and all the current passes. Right? So this is sort of a, an easy way, once if, if you can sort of master the, the, the complex numbers behind it, it's really, you know, then everything just becomes basically voltages, you know, resistors in series and parallel, and you just throw in the right complex impedance and just solve it, and it's done. All right? And you can do all your filters and everything else like that. All right. The, uh, the last part, the sort of formal double E part of this, the capacitor is, let's see, it's uh, epsilon, epsilon naught A over D. All right, so how, when you build a capacitor, all right, you've got E naught is the permeability of free space, free space permeability, permeability, and it's approximately 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 12. Uh, farads per uh, per meter. All right. You've got this one. This is relative permeability. Permeability. And this is um, one for air. And if you get clever about what things you use, certain dielectrics can get up to about you know 1,200. All right. So you can get things a lot a lot better than just an air gap between the two. And d is the distance in meters, and A is the area in meters. All right, so as a, a really simple example, if I take two plates, one centimeter on a side, all right, so one square centimeter, two plates across from each other, and I give them a gap of 25 microns, microns, and um, I put an air gap between them, I get about 35 picofarads out of this. Right? So you say, well, wait a minute. These capacitors are kind of small. How do they get, how do they get reasonable, how do they get microfarads out of this thing? And the answer is a lot of clever dielectrics, which changes this number, and a lot of clever geometry. So a lot of the tin can electrolytics, which are the big caps, uh, what they do is they have a very long strip of aluminum with a, a fluid in between that is the electrode and another long strip of aluminum, and they roll it up. Right, and they roll it up and put it in a little tin can and put two wires, one at the center, one at the, uh, at the outside. That's actually what you have. And those are polarized. If you reverse the polarity of them, uh, the can pops off and all that liquid squirts out over your, uh, um, over your circuit. Uh, yeah, occasionally you can get the casing to like fly like a little rocket. Um, uh, you have to get fairly high voltage to do that, but it's not bad. And just to sort of give you an idea of how much current this lets pass, if I look at a 10 kilohertz signal, Right, which is you know reasonably fast, and I look at one over j omega c for this. That's one over uh, j two pi ten k times thirty five times ten to the minus twelve. Right, and what that comes out to be is approximately in magnitude five mega ohms. So roughly a hundred k signal, thirty five picofarads, equivalent to a five mega ohm resistor. Not a lot of current passing through. All right, uh, take a look very quickly at the capacitors. All right, so uh, now capacitors are notoriously difficult to read the capacitance value off of because there is zero consistency off of these. So if you see something that looks like 103, right, a lot of your capacitors that you will see will say sort of 103 on them, um, that is 10 times 10 to the 3 picofarads, unless it's marked. Assume picofarads, all right? And so generally, um, most of the capacitors you'll see will range from a few picofarads up to tens of microfarads, and those are getting big, right? When you start looking at sort of a 200, a 200 microfarad cap, it's the size of your thumb, right? It's a, uh, it, it's a pretty big one. Um, so the, um, the tin can electrolytics, so you'll see on the side of them a symbol that often looks like this. So it'll have stripes going down it with a minus on it. That is the negative side. That lead that comes off that side, 
that lead goes on the minus side of the circuit, right? That's how you know which polarity. Um, you'll see on them, and again, these are basically these are coils of aluminum with a um, with a fluid in between, and you know the symbol generally. So we'll see something like that, and you're lucky if these guys are plus or minus fifty percent of the advertised value, right? You can get uh, ceramic disc kind like these are a little bit better. They're about uh, plus or minus 25%, right, roughly speaking. Uh, you don't get really accurate capacitors. Um, some that you will see, you'll probably see a little less than, uh, uh, than you used to. These are the tantalum gumdrops, tantalum gumdrop capacitors. And the reason they look like they're called gumdrops is they, they just, that's what they look like. Right, they're like these little bulbous gumdrops with two legs, and if you look on them carefully, one of them will have a plus inked onto it next to it. Um, they're usually yellow or orange. Um, they are inside. They are plates of titanium with tantalum in between. They're fairly high capacitance, so they have good uh, um, good values. They're on sort of the 10 to 20 percent range, but they're expensive. They're small and they have high capacitance because the dielectric of tantalum is in there, and there's a, kind of a worldwide shortage of tantalum. So they, uh, for a while, you couldn't even get them at all, and I think they're back in back in stock on DigiQ, but they're pricey. Um, so generally, unless you unless you need to fit something in small, you don't use them. Um, there are um, polyester. There's a whole bunch of different ones: polyester, mylar film, mylar film. Um, these tend to be, um, they go from bad to really, really bad, depending on uh, uh, which variant you get. Um, they're all over the place. Uh, they sort of nominally have the right capacitance, but not much, not much better than that. Um, what you'll see people do oftentimes uh, is they will, um, they'll do things in their circuit where they'll put two capacitors um, in parallel sort of a 0.1 microfarad tantalum and then a 100 microfarad electrolytic. And the reason they'll do that is essentially the tantalum is, is fast, right? But it doesn't have a whole lot of charge behind it, but it's quick. And so it'll respond to the higher frequency stuff, whereas you've got this big wide bucket to supply the low frequency stuff and anything lower than either of those two gets set up. Okay, and we will, um, so we will stop um, here, and we'll do the next one Friday at 10 a.m. I'll try to find a room, and if I don't find a room, it'll be here again. Yeah. Uh, yep, hold on. Give me just one second here, let me. Give me just one second. Let me, uh, all right, save that there, and let me stop this. Stop.